All right, everyone should get a little thing. Okay, perfect. Um, we're really excited to welcome uh, Jermaine Barnes and Shaheen Ribari this evening, uh, giving a talk about architectures of vigilantism. Uh, I'm gonna give a short uh, introduction for each of them and then I'll let them take it away. Uh, if folks have questions kind of throughout the lecture, feel free to write those in the chat and I'll moderate the Q&A at the end. Um, all right, so Shaheen Rudbari is an assistant professor in environmental design at the University of Colorado Boulder. In his research, Shaheen studies ways designers organize to address social problems. He bridges sociological studies of social movements and race with architectural theory. He's a founding member of the Spatial Justice Design Collective, which uses design and theory building to investigate how dissent and counter hegemonic tactics play out in space. His work contributes to theories of contentious politics in the spatial professions and employs ethnographic methods. His research projects are supported by the National Science Foundation and his group's work is published in architectural and sociological journals. Jermaine Barnes is an assistant professor and the director of the Community Housing and Identity Lab, uh, acronym CHILL, at the University of Miami. He is also the director of Studio Barnes, a research and design practice that investigates the connection between architecture and identity. Mining architecture's social and political agency, he examines how the built environment influences black domesticity. His design and research contributions have been published and exhibited in several international institutions, uh, most notably uh, the forthcoming exhibition um, Reconstructions uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. He's also shown at the Graham Foundation uh, and been published in the New York Times, Architect Magazine, uh, the Swiss Institute, Met Metropolis Magazine, Curbed, et cetera. Um, and the National Museum of African American History identified him as one of the future designers on the rise. Uh, I'm very happy to call these two also just dear friends. Uh, so I will let you all take it away. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was so kind. <laughs> when you nice zoom on me on my birthday, you get a nice <laughs> intro. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think, I think I speak for Shaheen and myself when I say uh, thank you, University of Minnesota, for the opportunity to present our ongoing work around vigilantism and architecture, uh, which is something that we've been discussing internally for over a year now. Our anniversary was September 14th, um, where we first met and found that we had shared interests in space, race, sociology, and anthropology. And this work is uh, one inflection point of a lot of research that we've done around this. Um, it's sort of become our passion project at the moment where we're trying to find different ways the tentacles of vigilantism finds its way throughout architecture. So uh, that said, I think it's only right that we get into it and we thank Mass Context. Mass Context is a architectural journal. Um, they're based out of Chicago, spearheaded by Iker Gill, Spanish architect and critic. He's actually the, uh, he runs the SOM Foundation as his director, executive director. And then he also is the curator for New Middles, the um, architectural uh, summer Columbus project, which Jennifer, you are a recipient of this year. So it's again, these tentacles find a way to, uh, to wrap themselves around, which is pretty awesome. And so Shaheen and I pitched this idea too eager as a way to talk about our fascination with vigilantism and architecture. And so periodically he allows guest editors to talk about something that interests them. And we were fortunate enough to submit a proposal which we think is gonna be quite interesting. Uh, also, Jennifer is a contributor to this, uh, to this issue as well. Um, I told her last year, it's been an anniversary since we met and I told her she would be my big sister from that point going forward, and she didn't have much of a choice. So in true little brother fashion, I will both embarrass her and make her proud the rest of this presentation. So that said, I will pass the baton to Shaheen, who will get us into the topic of this discussion, uh, and then you'll find me somewhere later on. You'll see my face again. 
spoken like a true vigilante. Um, <laughs> thank you again, Jennifer and everybody else. Um, this is a map of our argument. So we'll start with this first assertion that white hegemony is maintained through vigilantism. And we'll work through this together. And let's start off with this kind of first definition, how we think about hegemony as consensual and as internalized participation in systems of domination. So take racism as one such system of, dem of domination where one group of people takes advantage of another group of people and justifies it by some arbitrary measure, say, for example, the shade of your skin. When we buy into the difference in ability, intellect, and values um, based on this measure, we consent to this system. And then when we adopt or internalize the values and fears of dominant group of the dominant group, that becomes this idea of hegemony. And it's, it's different from domination. And that subtle difference, um, which kind of takes that idea of con consent and internalization is a key one for us to understand how, understand what our role is as architects in confronting the racism inherent in what we do and what we make. Um, theories of cultural hege hegemony, um, some of you might have been exposed to the work of Antonio Gramsci, and that's who we're drawing on primarily. These ideas highlight ways that dominant groups normalize, really normalize their world of view through establishing cultures that reproduce their control over oppressed groups. This idea of white hegemony in turn calls attention to how ideas of whiteness, white dominance, or white supremacy get baked into culture and are assumed to be normal. Over the history of the US from the early formations of whiteness, settler colonial elites and their descendants have built institutions that reproduced habits, values, practices, ways of speaking, discourses, collectively these things were called cultures that serve to benefit their interest at the cost of the livelihoods and the lives of others. And a lot of whites and non-whites take for granted these cultural norms without acknowledging their racist underpinnings and the fact that these norms were forcefully, violently, insidiously, at times overtly, at other times covertly, shaped to concentrate power and domination. So we're all subject to the influential power of white hegemony. Even white folks working on anti-racist agendas carry white hege hegemonic ideologies. For example, uh, in assumptions about the differences in achievement between whites and non-whites, differences in commitment, ideology, work ethic, merit, um, and discipline. These are really prevalent ideas that a lot of us carry. This slide here um, shows an image that typifies iconic, iconic imagery that helped produce a hegemonic idea of white culture and sort of a, a connection to an idea of like a virtuous family. The architecture figures prominently in this image and it's more than a backdrop to this normative family. It's a critical part of using the built environment to reify and deepen white hegemony. So we'll hop to uh, an analogy. I was asked to skip this, but I'm not, just kidding. Um, this, those of us who are students and teachers in architecture schools, I assume all of us on the call, we learn to perform to white architectural standards and behaviors. The white hegemony of studio culture, for example, is a forceful reminder of how we consent to and internalize hierarchies, work practices, aesthetic choices, and design thinking, and all of these are rooted in the history of whiteness and its connections with such processes historically as colonialism, capitalism, patriarchy, and specifically racism, especially in the US. In architecture schools, white architectural standards and behaviors are maintained and enforced by more than just white students and faculty. And this is what makes it hegemonic. So this is where this idea becomes really important for us. The racism of studio culture is one matter, but the hegemonic whiteness of that culture is different. Um, it's, it's more insidious, it's, it's gradual, it's forceful, it's entrenched. We often, you know, many of us on this call have experienced making painful adjustments in our own taste, our cultural values, and sort of the design genius that students bring into architecture schools in order to conform to standards set by a white cultural elite. And so this is an idea that um, a couple of sociologists, uh, Matthew Huey and Carson Bird, addressed directly when they acknowledged the entrenched operations of white hegemony. They show how, quote, assessment of whites by both whites and people of color in any given context depend on a larger shared ideal of what whiteness both is and should be. And then importantly, what they add is that, quote, 
This is policed through implicit and explicit social and cultural markers of, of authentic belonging. And it's this idea that we police who belongs and doesn't that hegemony helps us understand and then becomes sort of the basis of this idea of vigilantism that we're exploring. So let me take a step back and talk about sort of what causes white hegemony. It's driven in part by fear, in large part by really the fear of the diminishment of white identity. Carolyn Knowles, who's another sociologist of race and ethnicity, tells us that ethnic, raced, non-white performances of lifestyle attract censure and heighten fears of invasion, of invasion as transformations in which one set of white images and performances fear displacement by others, end quote. To protect against this sense of invasion, this abstract fear of invasion, um, which is really in response to a racist fear, white individuals internalize the sense of difference and superiority. The construction of the idea of whiteness draws on this specific dynamic. Um, and for those who are interested, I really recommend James Baldwin has an essay, it's called On Being White and Other Lies, and he offers a lot of really provocative insights in the idea of becoming white in order to maintain social and economic standing. Um, and it really illustrates how this fear that drives hegemony is super powerful. So understanding the causes of white hegemony lets us see how architecture then participates in the perpetuation of white dominance. Um, you know, if any of us take a walk through a school like mine, like yours, uh, you will likely find countless renderings of new urban developments in trending neighborhoods with branded districts, um, with mostly white people enjoying mostly white activities in mostly white spaces. Uh, you know, I, I keep thinking like how many craft breweries and in revitalized industrial neighborhoods that are branded as art districts have we all designed or even made kind of the subject of our studios. And what we think is, you know, if these projects don't serve to police shared ideas of whiteness in our schools and in our profession and the spaces we design and build, then what does? Um, this is a collage done by a student, Ana Colon Quinones, um, where she's exploring ways that we as architecture students internalize and consent to, remember those two key ideas, um, how we internalize and consent to white hegemony in our designs, um, in our renderings, and in our colorblind attitude around who does and who does not belong in the spaces that we imagine. White hegemony is often acknowledged or invisible, um, and that's what makes it really insidious with lasting and harmful effects. As a litmus test, we can start by observing the behavior of white users of space. Um, this is an image that Jermaine will share more on in a bit in the context of vigilantism. But it, it gets us thinking a little bit and kind of a useful reference is sociologist Elijah Anderson's work. He's done a, really, a lot of really powerful and important impactful work on thinking about white space. He reminds us that Quote, when encountering blacks in the white space, some whites experience cognitive dissonance. And if for no other reason than the need to set the dissonant picture straight, they become confused or disturbed or even outraged at what they see. In the interest of consonance, they try to put the black person back in his place, at times telling him in no uncertain times to go back where you came from, end quote. In other terms, what Anderson explains is how in the white space, small issues can become fraught with racial meaning, or he says, small behaviors can subtly teach or remind the black person of her outsider status, showing onlookers and bystanders, um, what later Jermaine will talk about as witnesses, which shows how all these folks, they show how she does not belong, that she is not to be regarded and treated as a full person in the white space. So there's a lot about a lot of clues as to how kind of space becomes more than just a container of the operation of this hegemonic whiteness. And these dynamics, they play out constantly and consistently in the spaces that we design. And they're perhaps most visible in everyday institutional spaces we create. They're overtly visible in spaces like prisons, but more covertly in spaces like classrooms or courtrooms, museums, um, even the social spaces of our cafes or our retail experiences in our restaurants. What we design serves as what um, Catherine McKittrick, who's a really amazing black feminist geographer, she calls this material spatialization of difference, which makes visible new or unacknowledged strategies of social struggle. 
If you haven't read her book, um, Demonic Grounds, I, I highly recommend it. I think it kind of exploded both of our brains when we started reading through it. Um, her analysis of the slave auction block, for example, is one that helps us broaden our thinking about the architecture of white hegemony, both historically and spatially. And for us, it's an architectural expression of the roots of white vigilance in the US. And so let me see if I can point this out to you. So if, do you all see this pointer on the slide? Okay. So over here, number five, this is a slave auction block um, marked out over here. And then number seven is the slave quarters. So that's this building over here. And this is, this is on this Green Hill um, plantation in Virginia that was mapped out the, um, I believe this is from a 1960 survey. The auction block and the slave quarters at this plantation um, in count, um, Campbell County, they're set sort of beside each other and adjacent kind of with, with this kitchen in between. The colorblind perspective calls the first, the auction block, an assembly of stones um, arranged as a platform. And the second, the, the slave quarters as a basic gable roof shelter. But they're really much more than that. Um, and this is kind of the push that we're arguing for architecture to make, to go beyond this descriptive um, understanding of architectural elements. McKittrick analyzes the auction block as, quote, a site of public racial sexual domination and measurable documentation. She writes about how, quote, racial positionings of the auctioneer, the buyers, the onlookers, the enslaved, hold steady this domination through the gaze, the exchange of money and bodily evaluation. She calls the auction block a technology that scales the body um, in much the way we think about scaling the body in architectural design. Um, she talks about how it displays black bodies in relationship to the wider landscape um, of, of the plantation. And in doing so as a platform or a plinth um, architecturally speaking, the auction block situates the white gaze of the buyers with the seller and the hegemonic image of the plantation all in, in connection with each other. So let's consider this next slide comparison. What conclusions, I mean, if we were gonna spend some time with this and I'll pause just for a moment just to let you kind of sit with it. What conclusions about the ongoing operation of the architecture of white hegemony might we start to draw? when we're looking at this, this um, the slave quarters at, at Green Hill and this image we encountered earlier. And this is a, another comparison. And again, we put this side by side to make this point that if we're gonna collapse the four posts and the two platforms of the auction block, this kind of tectonic dimension into an inert materiality, that's not to speak of it as architecture. <clears throat> that's talking about six stones in a configuration. But as architectural elements, these six stones have meaning, they have history. They're arranged to further a racist violence that's enacted by a system of slavery. So they gain a different kind of significance <clears throat> when we think about them this way. Excuse me. And you know, the same can be said about the, pre the image in the previous comparison, um, the adjacent gable roof slave quarters. The same, we argue, can also be said about the suburb suburban home that's pictured here. Um, and this idea gets extended beyond these historical references where, you know, of overt slavery. Joyce Bell, specifically a uh, sociologist at the University of Chicago, um, she studies civil rights and black power movements. She brings this line of architectural signification to the courtroom. And this, in a panel that we had a couple of years ago, she presented ways that black power activists disrupted what she called that quote unquote hegemonic white space of the courtroom. She talked about tactics that folks like Angela Davis, who we see here, um, Asada Shakur and members of the Black Liberation Army used to disrupt the spatial and social hierarchies of the courtroom. The physical situation of the judge, the examiners, the jurors, defendants, and the witnesses are all architectural expressions of the system of injustice that's defined by its racist history and racist present. And we'll kind of walk through grounding us these arguments in the architectural elements in a second. Another uh, sociologist, Wendy Leo Moore, writes about how law school buildings, law schools in general, and even US law, kind of the institutions of law broadly framed in the US are institutional white spaces. 
that they perpetuate this idea of white hegemony. If a law school building houses law school education that's used to perpetuate ways of legal thought that in turn produce laws that protect the power of white elites on the backs of black subjects, then even today that building can be evaluated in the same way um, that we were evaluating the posts and platforms of the auction block. It's a, it's a conceptual leap, but it's the same kind of situation within an a set of institutions of racism. So bringing significance to these spaces um, beyond just thinking of them as kind of colorblind, um, inert, tectonic and material expressions. This takes us back to um, a powerful statement by McKittrick and I'll, I'll share that here. Um, and this is again in the context of that auction block, but you see how she's extending it. She says, um, and I'll read this out to us, it becomes very clear that this structure, whether it be a tree stump, a stage or a table is created by those who are on, around and even distanced from the selling point. The processes and acts that produce the auction block demonstrate the ease with which race, ownership and profit culminated on the auction block and continually and continually substantiated the economic and ideological currency of blackness, whiteness, possession, and captivity. Um, this is an auditorium. This is where Jermaine and I met that a year and plus some change ago. Um, this auditorium or an auditorium like this tells us, especially architects, that a large group of people seated in the aisles are focused on one or a small number of people who occupy the stage. The aisles located closer to the stage confirm some benefit um, compared to the aisles at the back of the room. Further, the, yet even the seats in the middle of the aisles have a privileged vantage over the seats at the edges. In a colorblind interpretation of these layers of hierarchy, an architect might say that there's nothing racialized about these forms of proximity and adjacency in a standard sloped classroom. Um, e.g. the more attentive students might occupy the frontmost rows, those who arrive early might take the seats closest to the center, and the analysis usually ends there. But if we consider the white hegemonic context of the institution, our analysis then goes further, and that's really what we're advocating for. The presence of white bodies will affect where non-white bodies are welcome to sit. The aisles thus become racialized. If we consider the white hegemonic institute, the context of higher education and Western pedagogies, ways of teaching, a further interpretation of racialization presents itself. Hierarchical and patriarchal forms of learning where a historically white male figure occupies a platform of power and preaches coveted knowledge to his subjects um, are consistently racialized and gendered. And so it's, it's this way that hierarchical configurations of seats oriented towards a stage really conceal a deep seated racialized logic that we are often um, loath to consider or to really acknowledge. And on this point, again, I'll refer to McKittrick. Um, she talks about the classroom as a colonial site that was and has always been engendered by and through violent exclusion. Um, so there are perspectives, there are folks who are articulating these ways of thinking about these spaces that aren't as colorblind as maybe the majority of us um, frame them. As an alternative to this model of a learning space, um, for example, there are powerful forms of knowledge generation and sharing that have vast traditions that span millennia. Many of them occupy non-hierarchical spaces or communal arrangements. Um, so there are many alternatives. This is not something to be taken for granted that this is how, these, these are the kinds of spaces that we have to learn in. It's not a sort of a neutral or natural concept. That, that um, assumption of its um, naturalness or that naturalization is part of that, going back to that identity, that idea of hegemony is key to that definition. So coming back to our experiences of hegemony, um, in architecture, these are holistic experiences. We encounter typologies, elements, tectonics, and aesthetic aspects of our built environment all together. This all happens to us simultaneously. Um, this ex experience of white hegemony therefore is compounded. And we'll use this poem and read through it and kind of talk through it together to give an evocative and descriptive sort of illustration of this. And this is from Claudia Rankine's work, um, specifically this is out of Citizen. And I'll read us through, this is the first half of the poem. She says, the new therapist specializes in trauma counseling. You have only ever spoken on the phone. 
Her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides. Oops, sorry, let me get this. My screen doubled up for a second. I don't know if you saw it or not, but okay. Um, her house has a side gate that leads to a back entrance she uses for patients. You walk down a path bordered on both sides with deer grass and rosemary to the gate, which turns out to be locked. At the front door, the bell is a small round disc that you pr press firmly. When the door finally opens, the woman standing there, and I'll continue in a second, but let me just pause to emphasize the ways that the elements of this house are coded um, in this passage. The side gate, the back entrance, the path that's bordered with deer grass and rosemary, the locked state of the gate, the front door, its, bill, its bell, these are all given significance. Um, and architecturally, to us in our conversations, um, Jermaine and I, these start to represent threshold, private versus public spaces, controlled access, paths, and communication, things that we as architects all work with in, in designing. To folks for whom these architectural elements give the feeling of, of exclusion, the objects and their material characteristics are laden with racialized signifi signifiers and mechanisms of control. To those whom these elements give a welcoming feeling, these objects are also racialized. They keep the bad people out and they keep the fragile dominant groups safe from the diminishment of their markers of white identity. So let's, let's continue on with this um, passage and let me get in here. The woman standing there yells at the top of her lungs, get away from my house. What are you doing in my yard? It's as if a wounded Doberman pincher or a German shepherd has gained the power of speech and though you back up a few steps, you manage to tell her you have an appointment. You have an appointment? She spits back. Then she pauses. Everything pauses. Oh, she says, followed by, oh, yes, that's right. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. So, so sorry. So picture for a moment this therapist's house as a detached home in a white neighborhood, maybe not unlike the suburban home we saw a few slides back. The architectural elements speak volumes to those who have experienced racist encounters like this countless times in their lives. At a basic level, by mere association, specific types of residential architecture designed with particular architectural elements and coded with intentional aesthetics are connected to an experience or experiences of racism. At a less symbolic level, but at a, at a more spatial and functional level, a material level perhaps, Forms of architecture are embedded in centuries of white hegemony. Everyday spaces of homes, classrooms, courtrooms reflect this oppressive baggage. And so what we're arguing is that white hegemony is maintained by white vigilance. This is poetically and painfully expressed in you know, this passage in Rankine's work. Vigilance in turn then becomes a point of connection for us um, between these ideas of architecture and white hegemony. Jermaine. Thank you. So if Shaheen framed us at a macro level of sort of the ideologies and the theoretical and institutional mechanisms that facilitate white hegemony and how that then becomes a lens into vigilantism, then this is a point of departure to where I can explain how we're viewing vigilantism within architecture. Um, and specifically through these three avatars, the aggressor, the resistor, and the witness. Next slide, please. So this process really began um, last year when there were so many instances in the news of Black individuals being stopped or being harassed at various locations by, we'll call them vigilantes who protect the built environment. And most often these vigilantes were of a white ethnicity, a white race. And through this dissection and this investigation, Shaheen and I um, sort of came up with this idea of who are the major players of these instances? And so this image that you're looking at right now was done by Chris Damrich and we commissioned him to make it on our behalf because I made a tongue in cheek comment to Shaheen during one of our calls. And that comment was, 
I don't understand why these people feel the need to save these buildings. You're not Batman. Just take off your cape, calm down. It's not that serious. And so we sort of tried to figure out what empowers someone or may, what makes someone think that they have the right to police space? What about architecture um, engenders someone to give themselves the right? And the aggressor that we argue is one who analyzes spaces and then uses their power to curtail others' right to pass, to recreate, to express, or to simply be present. The aggressor utilizes prejudice and social majority to restrict access to space. The resistor is one who uses their political bodies, their spatial positioning, and other means to assert their claim to the right to use space. And so there's, there's a very clear distinction between there, right? It's the one who thinks they have the power to police it and the one who believes they have the right to occupy the space. So if we look at this image on the left, our superhero is most clearly the aggressor. She's the individual who believes she has the right to police this area, to work on behalf of other residents, to make sure that these individuals on the right, who are our resistors, who do not have the right to be there. But this is only two parts of a three-part uh, equation that we're working through. And the third is the witness. And I would argue the witness is perhaps the most important within this framework because the witness is our narrator. The witness witnesses spatial tactics, they have a relationship to the confrontation, and they have a role in interpreting and disseminating documentation. So the witness really has an important role because the way that we author interactions can be biased or unbiased based on who our witness is. Next slide, please. So in this slide that we saw before, most accurately, you can understand that Barbecue Betty is our aggressor and that the individuals who are cooking at the park who were then told that this is not allowed and ask for permits and things of that nature are our resistors and that they are within the space, they are acting against Barbecue Betty. And then the witness are those who pull out their phone to watch this and to disseminate that information to the world. So what we're trying to understand is one, how do these three avatars work in congruence? But then also, what about this type of space, excuse me, um, facilitates these types of interactions? So next slide, please. And so I think we found that a lot of times that goes to privilege. And it's the privilege that one believes, I have the right to be here. You do not have the right to be here. And this society has made me to believe and has empowered me and has created institutional laws that says, this is my right, this is not your right. And so this, um, this slide is very important and I wanted to put it in because this slide only happened because of what happened in Minneapolis this past summer. And obviously you all being in Minnesota definitely don't need to rehash on what, on what took place, but as far Southeast as Miami, we also had protests. And this is one of the slot, one of the signs that was captured during the protests in Miami. And I think it's very important because privilege is so critical to understanding white hegemony as well as vigilantism. Next slide. And so we go to privilege, which then gives us white flight. And this slide is from the 1960s and Data Research Center, which is another way that we empower individuals to then police space. Because if you're accustomed to certain locations having a very homogenous racial demographic, then any disruption to that normalcy is abrupt and it's aggressive and it's off-putting to many individuals. Even if that disruption is under uh, faithful and, and welcoming auspices, right? So if it's a black individual moving into a, a neighborhood and then unfortunately those houses immediately go down in value or there are uh, real estate developers who advocate for the removal of said family and the flight of existing families. And so all of these things are really entangled with each other into understanding how this entire process works in the built environment. Next slide. 
An example of this is in Miami. Uh, this is currently where I live and where I work. And you can see on this historic map from the 1960s, those black locations are the only locations that people who identify as black were allowed to live. Now, many will understand that in Miami, that spectrum that is blackness is very vast from different locations in the Caribbean and South America in the United States or from abroad, but it's all under the lens of the African diaspora. So while everyone's skin color is the same, their shared experiences are not. But that doesn't matter when we determine who gets to live where and who has the privilege to live where and who determines where these areas are. And if you've ever been to Miami, the most expensive area to live is by the water. And so the individuals who constructed this city were not allowed to actually live in the area that they worked unless they had a racial identification card. So not until the 1970s were Black people actually allowed to move through space and occupy Miami Beach without a racial identification card. Next slide. And so we get to this instance, which many of you might know about at the Starbucks, where the gentlemen were having a business meeting and the barista then called the police because they wanted them removed from the Starbucks. And so this is another one of those instances that we're trying to understand who was the aggressor, who was the resistor, and who was the witness? Because again, these are three avatars that we're really trying to, to define. Understanding that even within those three, sometimes one individual can oscillate between two. One can be both witness as well as resistor, right? If you have a cellular device, if you have a recording device, then you operate as both. But with that operation comes implicit biases. Because now as the witness, you're a part of this event, and as an aggressor, as a resistor, you have an emotional or physical attachment. So how does this blur the lines between those avatars and then who is able to understand the situation at hand when this goes to whatever authority or how does this inform architecture? How can Shaheen and I understand space better if the lines and the blurring of, of, these, of these personalities happens on, on multiple occasions in instances such as these? Um, I would challenge you to even look at this, this image and try to determine on your own those three avatars. Who would you see as the resistor? Who would you see as the aggressor? Who would you see as the witness? Next slide. And so one of the things we've been doing is trying to work through these process through diagramming. Uh, this is a mural board exercise that we did um, with some students at the University of Miami, where we gave them these instances of racialized encounters where there was an individual acting as their local Batman? And how do we identify the avatars within these situations? And how do we understand the way that space um, facilitates this? And so we'll go in depth more, but this is sort of the overarching idea behind the process that we've been undertaking. Next slide. So we spoke about before, trying to identify who are the witnesses in this space, the counter as surveillance, um, the recording processes, the, the adjacencies between the counter and the exit, and, and how do we deal with these interstitial spaces? Next slide. And then many of you might know this instance as well. This is in New York. This is the Eric Gardner situation in front of, in front of the, uh, the general store where he was unfortunately accosted and then lost his life over a pack of loose cigarettes. And so we look at this image as something that's completely devoid of people and so you can try to see this as a neutral understanding of space, right? So there's no, there's no one in here to give any implicit or explicit biases. There's simply a sidewalk, trees, and a storefront. Next slide. But then now, once we occupy that space with individuals, it starts to take on a narrative of its own. And so now with individuals within this area that was once neutral, now becomes a location of where friction and where, and where causalities can happen as we've seen with Eric Gardner. Next slide. And so this is the, the final output of this unfortunate interaction where he was choked, told that he couldn't breathe and unfortunately strangled to death. And within this area, again, we're trying to figure out who was the aggressor. Is it the individual who called the police or is it the police themselves? The resistor is most clearly Eric Gardner 
Now, the witness, is that the other officers who took a part of this and they're not taking part of this? Is it the, the witnesses, the people on the street who recorded it? Or is the individual, the, the store owner, who originally called the police, then changed his avatar to that of a witness watching this act happen? And then finding a way to justify his own actions of calling the police. Next slide. This is another instance. This is in St. Louis. This is Keith Ob Kelly. And so we started to think about how, does, how do we design spaces that then reinforce these things that are happening? What is it about the lobby? What is it about the key fob? What is it about the elevator that then takes on this own idea, takes on this own ideology of space? And I shared an anecdote with Shaheen that if you're a male, your experience in the elevator is probably most, most not probably, it most definitely is different than that of a woman, specifically because if you get on an elevator and it's you and a woman on an elevator, you might think, I will allow her to push the buttons on the elevator first. I'll be a gentleman, this is how I was raised, you go ahead. Not understanding that in that enclosed five by seven space, there isn't much freedom. So by you allowing that individual to pick first, you're theoretically putting them in harm. Because by then, you don't know if you get on the same location as them, the same floor as them, you might be following that individual. And these are sort of the things that we don't think about inherently because we are privileged. So again, taking back before that slide about who it, who it affects and who it doesn't affect. So as we're designing spaces and we're trying to design spaces better, and we're trying to design spaces that resist these institutions, then we have to put ourselves in the position of those who may not be in power the resistors, not the aggressors. Next slide. And so this is again that same process about how we design spaces. And I want to point to the green slide on there, the green post note that says, tell them how they're supposed to live. Because most often we as designers prescribe that that means of practice. Well, we tell individuals how they're supposed to live. We're not designing for the constituent, we're designing to the constituent. Next slide. This is more context to, to the location. Um, next slide. And then this is our third and final example. Uh, this is both Colorado and Seaside, Florida, two new urbanist uh, locations where the architecture is most definitely unbiased. The architecture prescribes a specific way of living that one has to, um, one has to abide by, where it's not allowed in these communities. And then it completely removes the ability for individuals to determine how they want to live. It completely restricts eth ethnic differences, which is something that we don't want as architects, because by restricting the differences in cultures, then again, we're empowering these acts of vigilantism where one, if you don't prescribe to the, the robotic ways in which other individuals live in these neighborhoods, then you're ostracized. And the HOA department or your local security guard or whatever other institutions that exist, find ways to restrict your mobility within these spaces. Next slide. And then this is a close up of that encounter. This is when a young man is walking around trying to clean his area in Colorado and a police officer follows him around and it costs him into a point where there were so many police officers at the location that they tried to find some sort of way to pacify him, pacify this gentleman who did absolutely nothing wrong. Next slide. And this is back to that instance in Seaside, Florida, where you can determine where, well, not so much you can determine, but we try to say that architecture is neutral. And we try to say that architecture has no biases, but humans design that architecture and humans have implicit biases. So it's impossible to say that architecture is neutral when it's not produced by a neutral, by an unneutral body. Right, and then we find ways that we continue to reproduce racism because of the way that we design these things. Next slide. So before we get to this short video um, that I wanna show, it's this overarching theme of vigilantism, white hegemony, um, all culminated really early in the spring into a criminal architecture course that I put together at the University of Miami. And this criminal architecture course is about the ways in which uh, space and race intersect and how it restricts mobility and how uh, planning and urban planning documentation has completely restricted 
uh, a subset of this country, specifically black individuals. And students were tasked with creating a music video which talked about the ways in which architecture was, was explicit and compulsory in these, in these types of um, instances. So we're going to play maybe the first two minutes of the video because um, it's quite long. We don't need to watch the whole thing. Um, and then we'll go back into the lecture from there. So Cheyenne, can you go to the video? And we can stop it at the two minute mark. Oh no. But well, we're having technical difficulties. We don't we don't have to show it if that's if that's an issue. We won't have to worry about it. we can just give it one more shot. Let's see if it let's just give it one more shot. If it doesn't work, then we'll yeah, if it doesn't work, we'll just go ahead and go forward. I think you'll want to click the unmute as well. Thank you. Oh no, we definitely don't want to do that. Oh, one of one of my students make this. There's a lot of curse words. So okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> do that. We even practice doing it without sound. Yeah, 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 we definitely don't want to do that. But um, ultimately, what this video is trying to show um, is the way that the liquor store, the gas station, these other local, in these other specific areas, really take advantage of architecture, right? So um, my student Misha. Uh, splices in rhino details of the ways in which architecture um, promotes these unfortunate acts of vigilantism and criminality. And I think, I think what's clever here is the way that he takes very innocuous situations and, and things that we don't think of, but then really shows the ways in which planning and, and policy help these unfortunate things, right? It says right there, excessive advertising, boxes of liquors and shelves, can't see in and out. Miami Beach recommends clearing those, but people do not, right? So if you can imagine if the guidelines said to take these things out of the window, how much more safe would these locations be? How less likely would one be to act as a vigilante if the architecture itself helped out? Can we, can we jump forward a little bit? Right, so if that one was the liquor store, this one is the gas station. And so in here, we're trying to understand the ways in which the shelves and the outline and, and the way that it's designed, again, creates these moments and these tensions that we only see play out in negative lights. Um, I, will, I will share the link to this video if people want to hear it with audio. But when we played it the first time, we're like, there's, there's no way we could play this. Um, on here because every other word is a curse word. But you know, I think the video is actually the video is actually pretty great. So I'll I'll stop that there because we're running kind of long. Um and then I'll pass it back to Shaheen. All right. Thank you, Jermaine. Um so to bring it back, the argument we're making through all of this is that architecture maintains hegemony through vigilance. And to protect white identity, we not only police one another, we police space, we police aesthetics, we even police such deep institutions as our curricula, uh, but that's a subject for another conversation. Um, architectures of vigilantism operate through aggression, resistance, and witnessing, as Jermaine just kind of talks us through. Vigilantism is not just an attribute of the occupants of the space we design, however. Um, we, we try to take it a little a step further in arguing that vigilance is an attribute of the architecture itself. The examples of the slave auction block, the suburban home, classrooms, cafes, parks, convenience stores, these are vigilante spaces that maintain white hegemony. Um, I don't know if anybody caught the, the conversation between David Brown, who's the artistic director of the next um, Chicago Biennial with Walter Hood a couple weeks ago. Walter Hood was talking about the semiotic dimensions of oppressive spaces. 
In other words, ways, signs, and symbols communicated racialized messaging in our built environment. We found his words to be super powerful and super inspiring as always with Walter Hood. Um, what he said reminded us of his work, which in so many ways reinscribes the landscape with counter hegemonic symbolism. His work and his words got us thinking about ways white hegemony operates in space beyond um, semiotics and symbolism, however. Uh, one second here. All right, cool. And I, I love this picture. In the 1970s, Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi with Stephen Eisenhower, they gave us a profoundly impactful vocabulary with which to think about semiotics or the operation of signs and symbols in architecture. Kicking off the postmodern revolution in architectural thought, we can argue that in many ways, we're still operating in a paradigm that they helped establish. But and you know, there's a but, we wonder about what the limits of thinking about semiotic or symbolic forms of violence are when we want to hold architecture accountable, uh, hold architecture accountable. The vigilante architecture that we're thinking through is responsible for more than semiotic, symbolic, or aesthetic violence. It's a it is material um, in its use of spatial hierarchy. It's material in its use of threshold. It is material in the control of circulation and the structuring of our behaviors. Design theorist Lauren Williams urges us to, quote, move away from innocence toward far more unsettling design modalities in order to interrupt design's folding of racism into its oppression, its operations, sorry. So our failure collectively to recognize the ways that whiteness operates hegemonically has served as an excuse largely for inaction um, in our field. If we acknowledge that the work that race does and the work that architecture does, we must see how these two serve to advance um, one another. And we'll close with this quotation from a uh, professor of African American studies, Ruha Benjamin. She writes that, quote, if we consider race as a, itself a technology, as a means to sort, organize, and design a social structure, and think back to all the images we've seen, as well as to understand the durability of race, its consistency and adaptability, we can understand more clearly the literal architecture of power. For us, architecture's role in perpetuating and entrenching racism in the US must be acknowledged in order for architects to address institutional racism. And it has been and it remains an intellectual challenge, I think, to connect architecture and racism. For Jermaine and I, it, it's sort of a, Every time we talk, every week when we're on a call, our brains hurt. It's, it's hard for us to do this, even building on all the amazing work that architectural theorists and designers have done. Um, but we believe that the challenge, that that challenge um, to connect architecture to racism has prevented our field from making significant progress and from demonstrating its relevance in efforts to challenge racism. Attempting to theorize architectures of vigilantism together with the contributors of this next mass context issue, um, including Jennifer, is really an attempt to bring together some of the voices that have been working to take that challenge on. So thanks for listening. Uh, we're eager to talk through your thoughts and questions. I'll turn it back to Jennifer. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, Thank you. Really, yeah, really. Uh, Fantastic. I want to open it back up to uh, everyone in the room. If there are questions, feel free to um, just say them or uh, <laughs> I just finally read this slide. <laughs> um, just say them or uh, feel free to post things in the chat. Uh, so we'll give a little bit of time for people to collect their thoughts. Um, but I really appreciate it. So many aspects of the talk. Oh, go ahead. We, um, we uh, we definitely realize that that it's some it's some pretty heavy stuff, um, and a lot of it was actually born out of a very light conversation. If I'm being totally honest with you, like it really just started as a joke, and then the joke was by me saying to Shaheen, "Why the hell do people care so much about buildings that's not theirs? Like this this is not yours. Why do you care so much?" Can you please go sit down somewhere? Like, stop trying to save every single building. It's not that big of a deal.
I remember that. Stop being Batman. That's what you said. Yeah, people do need to stop being Batman. It's not that it's not that serious. Well, I think you you know eloquently demonstrated that that these um, architectures are representative of something else, right? That that the um, the architecture becomes the kind of like metaphoric context for other sort of. Uh, loads other relationships other like ways in which we think we're supposed to interact with one another mm -hmm. um so I, i'm trying to give cover in case anyone <laughs> wants to write a question in the chat um actually can we can we ask you a question me yeah oh god okay <laughs> yeah i mean and 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 my question is because you are a contributor to to this issue um, how are how are you framing vigilantism? Yeah, I think you know. I think actually your words of the aggressor, the resistor, and the witness, um, you know, are actually uh, really apt. I mean, my contribution to the magazine is actually a photo essay, so. Uh, I live in the Seward neighborhood in, in Minneapolis. For those of you who are uh, in the Twin Cities, you probably know where that is. Um, and so I live very close to the third precinct. It's about a 15 minute walk from my house. Uh, and so, you know, the week of May 25th uh, till about uh, June 4th or so, um, I basically was just, uh, my partner and I, Tom Carruthers, uh, we had practiced together, uh, were basically taking walks. And so we were sort of performing um, maybe the witness role, uh, mm -hmm. occasionally joining in as a resistor when it felt safe to do so, mm -hmm. um, but primarily just bearing witness. Um, to what was happening on our streets, on, on Lake Street in particular, um, to the response to those actions by various parties. Uh, and, so, and so much of the kind of, you know, thinking about what it means to hold a vigil, right? And to um, observe things as they unfold. And honestly, I'm still, processing a lot of that, you know, like what it meant for me and my family, um, what it meant for my neighbors, for, uh, you know, our commercial strip of my neighborhood is now, you know, pockmarked with <laughs> uh, burned down buildings and, um, you know, destroyed lots. And, and so I, I think, um, and much of it was also how architecture kind of became a proxy, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the photographs in the photo essay is of, um, I think it's a TFC bank building uh, that, you know, first of all, it's, it's very much set back from the, from the kind of street edge, uh, you know, a, a sort of vast parking lot sort of precedes it in the, in the um, sort of foreground of the image. All the windows are boarded up with plywood, which is a kind of, you know, as we've all are, have been wearing masks to protect, or protect ourselves from COVID, these buildings also took a kind of dressing, a kind of, um, you know, secondary skin of these plywood masks uh, as a, you know, and I was just really struck by um, how much it was about the preservation of property uh, over people in that, in that instance. Um, so, you know, many of the images kind of contend with that, with the just destruction, but also with the kind of um, the the sort of you know social codes that are kind of like overlaid on on those contexts. So um, I don't want to talk too much, but that's <laughs> that. Those are some of the thoughts that have been swirling around in my head about about this issue. All right, I'll just say one more thing on that. Just real quick, the that idea you said about architecture as proxy, I think, is extra interesting, and I think that's something we're just struggling to like kind of make that, acknowledge that. Um, and I think you know what we're talking about in this presentation is maybe our latest thinking around that. But 
you know, is, is architecture a, a, a proxy, a container, um, or does it have more agency? Is it really sort of, um, uh, is, it, is it fundamental to, I think those ways of thinking about architecture in relationship to, you know, the events that were happening um, deserves debate and is complicated, I think. I mean, I think it takes on one of those roles, right? Yeah. The architecture can be the aggressor, it can be the resistor, it can just, I actually don't know if it just passively witnesses like ever, but um, mm -hmm. usually it's, 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 it's sliding around in one of those, those three, I think just as much as the people are doing so. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Christopher Larson. Do you think the saying, quote, if you say something, if you see, maybe it see something, say something, plays into this negatively, do you think it creates a space that promotes vigilantism? That's great. Um, I'll, I'll jump in with some thoughts and then Jermaine and Jennifer, please um, contradict me, I hope. But I, I think, you know, yeah, like, like, like stop and frisk, like um, all these policies, there are a range of sort of formal to informal ones, ones that are given to kind of the powers or the groups that as a society, we supposedly have given authority to police space. So if the police stop and frisk, I think a lot of us say, well, it's okay. You know, a lot of, I think, you know, a scary majority might say that that's okay because it's kind of, it, it's, it's done by the state. Vigilantism or the idea of a vigilante is somebody who takes power that has been given to a state, sort of um, a state organ that has the right to use power, they take it into their own hands. So a vigilante is a more sort of informal um, use of that power and that violence. And this idea of kind of, if you see something, say something, um, in a way is interesting because it's bridging that divide a little bit. It's, it's formalizing us as a society, us who are not police, us who are kind of everyday riders of the, of the train. Um, it's formalizing our policing power and our vigilance. And I believe that it is inherently racist, um, especially the context in which it's given. So, you know, you'll see this uh, in public transportation, you'll see this in public spaces, in spaces of um, social services. You won't see it as much in other spaces which are highly policed or more white. You may, you, sometimes we do see like a neighborhood watch sort of um, insignia on a telephone pole in a, in a well-off neighborhood. Um, but I do think this kind of messaging is dominated or dominates really the landscape in places kind of like the no loitering signs. And that's another contributor um, chat, Travis was um, contributing to this essay in his project, Yes Loitering. These kinds of signs I think are asking us to participate in a white hegemonic system because crime is so racialized in this country. If it wasn't, if we didn't have this, you know, this history of racism and slavery and settler colonial violence, um, I think it could have been different, but we do. I think, you, I mean, I think you, you, you gave a spectacular answer. And I think one additional component to that scenario is that the see something, say something carries completely different connotations when it's in a homogenous environment. If it's an all black environment, that's considered snitching. If it's in an all white environment, still consider snitching, but in that case, less as far as calling the police. So then we think about who has the right or who has ownership of the police force. So when we look at suburban neighborhoods or gated communities, who selects the, the watchtower? Who selects the guard? Who selects the, the local um, security organization to police these neighborhoods, right? So in those cases, both the resident is the, is the owner of the police system and the reinforcer of the police system. And then we get these ideas of see something, say something when you don't see someone who looks like you. And I think Shaheen, uh, specifically said it, I think he said it so eloquently, where it's also, in my opinion, inherently racist, because when one can use the rhetoric that if one group of individuals are fine people and a similar group of individuals are doing the exact same act are terrorists, 
then what makes those individuals different beyond? And in those cases, we have to figure out how do these things seep into our mind in the way that we experience space. Um, and because I, I would argue it's a massive influence because it really determines who's allowed in locations and who's not allowed in locations. And I think that's, I mean, what you're saying, Jermaine, this is so spot on and it speaks to this broader idea of hegemony too. It's not necessarily white people who see things and say things. We all do it. So we're all giving our consent. We're all internalizing this system. We police each other too. That's, that's the difference between kind of a system of domination and a hegemonic system. This is, to me, I think this is such a great question, Christopher, that you're asking. Um, this idea of see, say, see something, say something is deputizing all of us, whites and non-whites, in criminalizing non-whites. Um, so that's that, the hegemonic logic to it, which is really powerful. What a great question. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a, um, it's coded language. It's funny, I, you know, when you started showing Rudolph Hall, I was like, <laughs> you know, um, having gone to Yale for seven years, um, you know, very familiar with that building. And so I, I'm wondering if you can, you know, speak to architecture's codes, right? Like if, if, if the phrase, if you see something, say something is a kind of, you know, that's a, a uh, a, a textual code that you know shows up as signage as you know it, it, part of the wayfinding part you know it has a kind of material presence in space but it's it's two-dimensional it's flat like what are yeah I'm wondering if you can expand on like what are architecture's codes yeah yeah I think that's so interesting um such a good question and I again I think that's maybe a core of part of the argument that you're getting at which is Kind of going beyond um, just the symbolic dimension of architecture, maybe the flat two-dimensional graphic kind of symbolic um, expressions of vigilantism to material, physical, three-dimensional, spatial. Um, so with Rudolf Hall, for example, and forgive me, this will be the last time. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> fine. <laughs> We're having this kind of weird trend of putting in images relevant to the spaces where we're giving talks. So we had Seaside at University of Miami where a lot of the kind of new urbanism came out of. Um, I'll have to tell you later about the Denise Scott Brown reference. Um, but, so with Rudolph Hall, or I mean, architectural buildings in general, the first thing I started thinking about was our experiences of just say a crit critique, um, what we pin up um, or, you know, a review, a juror review. There, there are, um, uh, the optic, the optic kind of the ways people are seen, the ways we're scrutinized um, by jurors, by our classmates, um, kind of seated around our, the space where we're pinning up our work, but then also passers-by, the larger building. I think they're all, you know, they're, they're connected. Maybe it's not a super strong connection, but it's a very vulnerable moment early on, you know, in our early studio reviews, well, in all our studio reviews, but especially early when we're being acculturated into kind of a white hegemonic system of architecture. You know, coming into architecture school for a lot of us, there's a, there's a moment of shock, you know, there, there's kind of learning of what is, what kinds of styles are, are you know, pass, you know, what representations of, of culture are okay, which are not. And a lot of times I think, especially for students from underrepresented backgrounds or, you know, kind of non-dominant culture backgrounds, um, there's a lot of rejection of their cultural values. Um, you know, you can't really express that in, in the work that we're doing. That's, that happens in a lot of studios and it's probably maybe kind of like a big part of the pie chart of studio experience. In those pinups, there, that's a moment of humiliation, I think, for a lot of us who have the audacity to represent things that are not conforming to kind of a white hegemonic studio culture or culture of architecture. Um, we get punished. And jurors make fun of us, you know, our, our peers see us, you know, sweating up there and, and crying. Um, but then the building itself also, you know, with, with a building like this, like I'm thinking of CCA, I'm thinking of Rudolph Hall, I'm thinking of places where um, 
there is very much a spectacle of the review um, and the juried review that's visible to everybody who's coming into the building. It's part of what defines the building as an architectural space, a space of criticism, of display, of our acculturation. Um, in that way, I think kind of like, you know, the terraces, the visibility, the views um, of things that are happening become part of, you know, reinforce this strategy of hegemony. Um, and, you know, it could be a strategy without a strategist. It might not be that, you know, the architecture, the architect designed the space is like, okay, we're going to do this way. So people feel extra nervous. So they become, you know, conforming architects. It might not be that, but it's embedded in how we think about um, review, criticism, and kind of the production and consumption of architectural work by students. So I think that's one way that we could start maybe thinking about Rudolph Hall specifically. And I think that's part of the reason why we chose that image um, was sort of how the spectacle of architectural production is put on display in that building in a really powerful way that's very admirable for a lot of us. But for others of us, it could be very scary and daunting. Mm -hmm. So it's really fascinating to hear you um, break that building down because I remember the the terror of selecting my seat in studio each year of like, I don't want to be so exposed. I don't want everybody to like see me in the tray. And I did my best work when I had a seat that was very tucked away in a corner and had a very slender window that looked out onto the corner of Chapel Street. It was like this optical like release from being so watched myself also in that in that building um so it's a really um astute kind of description uh of some of the kind of material effects that are present in that place uh, really appreciate it uh, a question from Athar when trying to analyze how power is exercised through spatial configurations like what your students brilliantly did what kinds of things do you think we can try to be sensitive to and or keep in mind? Yeah, I can I can take this one. I was um I saw that in the in the chat and I started to just write some things down. Um, because I think the, the first step, Athar, is to understand who is the city for? Who are you designing for? Because I think that will help to determine the successes or failures of design. And so I think about um arguments for inclusivity and smart cities right and this idea that let's make cities less car centric and make it so that people can walk around places but if we do that and we understand that many individuals who don't have economic mobility live in locations where they depend on their car because infrastructure is subpar because trains don't reach the locations because buses don't run frequently so the car is essential just to maintain a basic um, a basic cost of living. And so we see these things and we don't, we don't prescribe these extra layers to them. We just assume cars are bad, cities are good, walking's better, bikes are amazing. And we completely remove in a, a part of society that depends on it because of all of the other unfortunate ails in society, right? And then we think about how can we fix these things? How can we address these things? How can we alter them? Well, I think one step is when we look at just planning and zoning codes. Who determines setbacks? Who determines how much area one gets? Who determines density? Who determines if something to be single family or non-single family home? All of these things reinforce racism. Um, Minneapolis is a location where you basically abolish single family housing zoning, right? And so if single family homes are one of the biggest indicators of, of family wealth, and that's something that's gone. And now you're beginning to equal the playing field. Um, there's a neighborhood in Miami that has a completely public park. You can go in at any time you want, but they place the park inside of a gated community. So in order to get to a public park, you have to go through a gate with the guard and say you're allowed, yes, Morningside, and say you're allowed into this neighborhood. So just think about that, right? I mean, it's a public park. Anyone can go, you can play on the basketball courts, but just the fact that it's placed inside of an enclave means it's no longer technically public. And so all these are ways that architects are, are complicit in this, in this game of vigilantism. And these are all things that we easily can change just by, um, 
just by acting on our agency. We got a couple more great questions here. Um, Charlie Townsley, I'm curious about the relationship between architecture and owner in the context of vigilantism. Are you aware of examples of new owners changing buildings from vigilantes to friendly neighbors? And what might those changes say about the architecture owner relationship in vigilantism? Mm, that's a good question. Go for it, Shane. <laughs> I'm thinking, give me a second. That's a really good question. I mean, I personally don't know of any. Um, I, I will say that most examples of the friendly neighbor is, is in locations where there's a prominent, um, a prominent culture of, of family and community mm -hmm. and the locations where you know your neighbor. And again, most often those are areas that are homogenous, unfortunately, right? Whether it be all black or all um, Hispanic or all white, but those are the most um, the most readily available examples I can think of. Mm -hmm. I live in an apartment complex. I do not know the names of my neighbors at all. We're literally right next to each other, unless there's a hurricane. And then we ask each other who's leaving the building, who's not leaving the building. <laughs> but that's even more informal. So um, I think that that's something that can happen if there's more input from not necessarily the owner, but the residents. Because I'm not sure how an owner could, can facilitate, say, a condominium and individuals being friendly within a condominium. Mm -hmm. I think that's such a great point about, yeah, the, 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 the occupant adding that into the mix. Um, and the, yeah, the user, the occupant, the owner, the designer, the building itself. You know, one thing that's coming up in my mind as, as you respond to this, Jermaine, um, is, you know, people who are trying to um, bring anti, do anti-racist design, you know, trying to think about, you know, it, it's happening maybe this outside of design, say like in a curriculum. Um, and I know University of Minnesota has this great statement on your website. Um, but like, you know, say architectural curriculum, people are trying to see like, how can we decolonize this? Or how can we make this anti-racist? How can we change, how can we change, say, what we teach in architecture? I take that as an analogy and let's think about it spatially. You know, some people are thinking about how can we modify architecture to become anti-racist? And I think um, people are thinking about aesthetics, people are thinking about semiotics, um, changing kind of signs and symbols. Um, and I, I, to my understanding, it's I haven't I haven't seen examples of ways people are taking it beyond that. I'm sure they're out there. I'm just not aware of it yet. Um, and if anybody on this call does know, I, I think it would be really helpful for me selfishly just to, to become aware of them and to know about them. Um, I will say though also that um, oh, I was going to give an example. What was the example? Lost my train of thought. Give me one second. Okay, if it comes back, I'll jump in. I lost it, but I think I had an example. <laughs> well, I was, I was just gonna say, you know, I, I think it's a really provocative question because I think it does come down to uh, a matter of, of agency and to a certain extent, um, people being willing to have a different relationship with power and with what it means to own, uh, right? So I think about models like, um, like dividend housing or something like that, right? Where you may have renters who, um, it's a mechanism by which renters can actually like build some semblance of equity. Uh, so they don't, it's not like a co cooperative where you like actually own shares and you kind of, you know, co-own a property, but you get some sort of return on your investment of renting in that building, right? And so, um, also as part of the kind of dividend housing model, I think what is kind of brilliant about it is that people do feel more of a sense of ownership over where they live and more of a sense of community. And, um, you know, there are structures in place. So yeah, you know, maybe you have to live there for a certain number of years before you get vested. But then when you leave that property, you actually get a return, right? So um, I, I think, I think many of those kind of models where uh, the kind of architect owner relationship 
the, the, the relationship between the tenant and the owner of a property are changed. To, it changes the dynamic in the sense of ownership and maybe the kind of uh, attitude of like worth and value and who belongs in that place. Um, so I don't know, I'm working on a project now where we're trying to do a sort of like our artwork is a anti-racist design overlay to like design guidelines in this huge development will to be continued whether or not that actually like works, but we'll see. Um, okay, maybe last question here, um, which I think is actually somewhat tied to the, to the previous one. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding Jane Jacobs's eyes on the street and seeing saying something. Um, yet, yet aren't, aren't we in some ways moving forward, moving toward policing ourselves in the other direction, i.e. asking one another to say something when we see discriminatory behavior. Extending this, to what extent are you hopeful about whether eyes on the street in our neighborhoods can evolve to be seeing one another as a way of connecting with one another? So Hank, can I, can I go first? Because my Yeah, go first because I don't have a positive message. <laughs> hey, neither, neither do I. Neither do I. <laughs> I thought I thought maybe if I went first, you could end on a positive note. But we'll I guess, just drill it down. Go for it. I guess, I guess we're both just gonna kill it. Um and that's and, and that's not to the author of, of the question. Uh Gayla, it's a fantastic question. Um, I just have a fundamental issue with that damn book. I am I am not a fan of, of that book at all. And I'm not a fan of it because the author is so privileged that her observations of the neighborhoods that typically are filled with black and brown people is written in such a pithy way that she even says things like, we need to observe these neighborhoods from our cars because they're like animals. Like in, in what world would you call black and brown people animals and get away with it? Architecture books. So in that in that first paragraph, in that first section where she talks about sidewalks and the understanding of how we move through cities, I was like, holy hell, this is racist. <laughs> like, like at no point does she even talk about race, does she use proper terminology? It's all this abstract, excuse my language, Jennifer, it's all this abstract shit. That annoys the hell out of me, and I'm and I'm reading. I'm just like, like this can't be serious. Like, why is this book a bible to so many people, when it just completely removes a massive amount of culture in the city, and that's ultimately, in my opinion, what makes the city rich. It's the cultural diversity, and to reduce that to something that's not to be celebrated, really pisses me off. And so I'm like, that's just crap. However. I think this idea of policing in the other direction is important because to me, that's just called normal decency. And I hope that we can reach a point where people are just normally decent. If you see someone not minding their own business and asking a six-year-old if they have a permit to sell cookies, like I would hope that you would tell them, lady, get the hell out of here. Like I would hope that people would do that because otherwise, like, what are we doing here? What are we doing? I'll make it even worse. Um, I think, you know, I, I, those, I, yeah, what important points. And I think just at the end there, you're bringing up, I think some of what we're thinking through is like witness, resistor, aggressor, um, that the, it's the roles that we play in vigilance, Gala, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, are complex. And I think there's, there's a lot for us to sort through and think through there. In the US um, and in a handful of other countries, I'm not super optimistic that we can um, extend this in a way that, you know, um, like the idea of eyes on the street as a way of connecting with one another. Cause I believe that this white hegemony is so deep. It's so entrenched and it occupies the way so many of us, me see the world and see social relations. I don't know that I could get beyond that. Um, I think there, you know, you know, people who talk about implicit bias, I think that's like one aspect of the expression of hegemony. Um, I think there are many others. So because of the racist history of the US, um, um, kind of the violent settler colonial history, um, I don't think that we can divorce ourselves from that 
um, easily, like within a matter of generations of some revolutionary change um, to where we can take something like vigilance um, and make it positive. Um, I think it will be fundamentally exclusionary um, in this context. So that's not super hopeful. I think it would have been better if you went second, Jermaine, because yours was a little less <laughs> painful. <laughs> Okay, so now you both have to say something positive to end. <laughs> oh, that's easy. That part's easy. Just, that, that question was tough. Um, I, I actually do have a lot of hope for the future of architecture. And I do because young people are so much more brave than we were in school. A lot of the young people on this call are so much more, um, so much more forward thinking and it's so much more forceful in what they want out of their education. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think when we were in school, it was more so this is the way you learn and you don't rock the boat. And so I actually appreciate the way that, that, that young people actually work now because they're quick to tell you, I don't want to learn that. I don't care about that. Or that's not inclusive. That's not how I want to practice. And to me, that's exciting. And that's why we're able to get interesting content out of things like vigilantism because we're finding people who want to find ways to enact their agency in more positive ways. So like, cheers to the young people. Uh, they're kicking ass. I'm a huge fan. <laughs> You're like, ditto what he said. Yeah, you don't want me to open my mouth. Um, I really like what Jermaine said. After, my, <laughs> after our weekly calls with Jermaine, I am a different person. Um, I'm gonna fade away. <laughs> I, I will, okay. Let me just say something. I, maybe it'll end positively. I'm a very happy person, so I don't, know, I don't know if optimism um, is a necessity here. Um, you know, I don't know that there we need to have an optimistic outlook. I'm not sure. You know, when I when I read the work of like people I really admire um, from you know the the activists and the organizers of, of the civil rights era and beyond, there's always a message about optimism in there. Um, but I. For some reason, I, it just hasn't occurred to me that that's like foundational to mm. period. Um, and I, I, I just think I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm still primitive in my thinking. Um, but you need you more know, grace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody. Um, but uh, going back to what Jermaine said about young people, I, you know, that's that's really mm, it, intriguing to hear. You know, I was reading Sharon Sutton's book about um, the changes at Columbia in the late 60s. Uh, when the ivory towers were white. Yep, when ivory, when ivory towers were white. And in the end of that book, I mean, there was so much amazing work that happened, curricular transformation, you know, more equitable access to the program. But in the end, it, there was this very powerful white backlash and it all pulled back, you know, in the space of like four or five years, all the progress went away. Um, and I think in so many ways, the progress of the civil rights era, there's major advances, but a lot of it really just went into kind of more entrenched, more invisible for some spaces. Um, so, you know, if, if, if the young people are our hope, um, I would, you know, just going back to the conversation here, being mindful of ways hegemony operates, how we all buy into it, being mindful of ways institutions, especially in the US, are white and hegemonic spaces from architecture curriculum to how we run our reviews, to how we design, to everything. If I think if we're not vigilant about the power of those structures to guide our thinking, as, as progressive as we are, I, I think that we ultimately lose because we become indoctrinated, we internalize, we become, we, we believe in the system. Um, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, maybe vigilance is a good word um, to kind of end my, my thought on this with that, yeah, be super vigilant. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, you two. Um, Thanks for having Really excellent presentation and, and great questions, great discussion. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you all. Great conversation, and, great questions. And folks will be able to find this recording soon on our uh, College of Design. YouTube oh, and I put the video and... link in the in the chat. Oh yeah, to the one with the swearing. It's actually, yeah, it's Great. pretty good. It's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. If this was my class, I would have played it. So I, <laughs> I, I appreciate you know you being mindful of our our tender ears here. <laughs> yeah.
no, uh, thank you both so much. This is really fantastic. And it was, uh, you know, just lovely to see you. I wish you, I wish we could have you here to actually host you. Uh, Jermaine is an excellent dancer. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much uh, to both of you and, and good luck on the, on putting the, the book together. I know I owe you some stuff, but um, hopefully at the rest of it is coming together. <laughs> We're good. We're good. Thanks and thank you again. All right. Cheers, y'all. All right. See you tomorrow. Jennifer, can you pause the recording or stop oh, it? Yep, stop. <laughs>